interview and job search strategies that work. I'm here with Gary, Gary Rada again. Hey, Gary, how are you doing today? I'm good, Gary. How about yourself? I'm fantastic. Happy Friday to you. Happy Friday to you. Um, Likewise. I, I want to ask you, right? So um, this is something actually that I've been thinking about, but for, for I know a lot of people have been thinking about this and it's, there's a thing called a side hustle. There are people talk about getting a side hustle, having your own business. And I get that. That's awesome. However, there's people out there like myself, in some regard anyway, who just want to do a nine to five and they want to do another nine to five or part-time gig. Say for instance, um, you know, a systems administrator, but they don't want to work at home Depot. And they're like, they'd rather be in the IT field and they just want to do a part-time gig, say 20, 30 hours a week um, because it's a higher pay. Say now they make $30 an hour and they want to make something say like $20 an hour. And, sure. you know, could you talk about that? Like the type of um, a recruiting aspect or in, in jobs in general that, that you see from your end? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a great question. And, and, and it's something that I, I, I ran into a lot over the years, which was, ah, uh, boy, you know, like as a recruiter, I would, let's say, I'll use you as an example. Let's say I would call you and say, hey, Gary, I have this, uh, you know, this full-time contract opportunity. And, and you might respond and say something of the sorts of, you know, uh, I'm, I'm currently engaged on a project right now. I don't actually have really the bandwidth of the time to take on something else. And I don't want to leave the job that I have right now. But, you know, if you've got something that's like, a, you know, part time or, uh, you know, 20 hours a week, 10 hours a week kind of thing, like, you know, I'd, I'd love to pick something like that up. And I'll tell you that from, I'll, I'll give you, I guess, a little bit of insight into uh, how that would, how I always receive that information or, or would often receive that information would be like, I don't want to hear that. Right. Like, and, and for me, the reason that I would say that, and, and I'll, I'll qualify where I'm going with that, but um, because for me, it wasn't very common that somebody would call, a client would call and say, hey, I've got this 10 hour a week gig or I need this type of person. And, you know, I could really only promise this kind of hours where I'd be able to pick that phone back up and say, hey, Gary, great news. I happen to have this customer who has this 10 hour a week need. Now you've got your, your side gig or your side hustle. Um, so for me, it wasn't that frequent that I'd have an opportunity like that, but from personal experience, as well as in the recruiting space, I do have some insights to share on how that usually goes, um, what it really looks like. And, and more importantly, I think, um, some, what I hope is good advice for folks that are starting to think of opportunities in that area and, and really kind of some things that they should be keeping in mind and, uh, maybe some realities uh, to think about as well. So um, first things first. So, okay, I want a side hustle. What do I need to do? Well, traditionally speaking, uh, if you're going to step away from something that's, that's core, that's your key expertise, something that where, where really you're a, a subject matter expert in that space and you now want to do something different, right? A little left of center. I think first thing to keep in mind, you know, especially like before you pick up a phone and talk to a recruiter or you're already on the phone with one and talking to one about a different gig is keep in mind that what you might be looking to do on the side might not be something where you are as much of an expert in or perhaps even an expert at all as compared to what your core competency would be. So keep in mind of who you're talking to. Um, a great example of that would be, you know, if you're talking to somebody like I was a, who focused solely on the senior level space um, and you're looking for an opportunity that might be more in that entry level or mid-level space, you know, maybe you know, keep in mind that that person might not be actually the best source of job opportunities for you. Um, and so meter your expectations as far as, you know, how viable of a resource that person could be for you. Um, does that make sense, Gary? Just oh, to start with, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I know what you're saying. Right, you know, you're, you're I, I get it what you're saying. You're a, a leader, uh, you're a PM, let's say, right, and you go into another field, or um, the recruiter, they, they don't they don't have those low-level jobs, if you will. I, and I fully understand what you're saying. They don't have the, um, the recruiter doesn't have the the reach, or it, he or she doesn't know. Yeah, I completely yep. All right, 
Perfect. So, so, so we're on the same page with that. So, but what I usually advise people to do, and I would do the same in this scenario is if you had, and we're going to start kind of with a comparison here, which is, um, you know, if you had a, you've got a, a car and you've got a motorcycle and your motorcycle needs service, are you going to drive your motorcycle to the Ford dealership and ask the service technician, what's wrong with your motorcycle and how can they fix it? Well, no, right? Because they don't specialize in motorcycles. And while you could potentially get absolutely lucky and that particular technician happens to be a motorcycle rider themselves and says, well, maybe I can help you after hours. No, you're going to take a motorcycle to a motorcycle dealership. You're going to take a car to a car dealership or to a service center that specializes in that. So uh, I'm taking the long road of saying, if you're working with a senior level recruiter for senior level positions and you're looking for a side hustle, find yourself, get an introduction to, or simply put yourself out there online on the number of different job posting opportunities, Indeed's career, Monster, Dice, et cetera, and look for that entry level recruiter, somebody who's going to have a high volume of entry to mid-level positions in the field that you're looking to break into and have that person in your virtual Rolodex as a source of opportunities for those lower level positions. So now you've got someone who specializes in helping you find positions in that core competency in which you're an expert. And now you also have someone in your back pocket who is out there actively searching for, or at least someone you can call for those opportunities when you have the time. Does that make sense? Oh, exactly. I know what you're talking Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I know what you're talking about. I, I'll, I'll, I just thought of a strategy to, to actually get into that niche or whatever, uh, but I'll let you yeah. finish your thought. Yeah, no, and, and absolutely. And so it's, it's, it's aligning the things that you want with what's available to you that, or the people that can help make that, that side hustle a reality. And, and really there's no, nothing better, especially if you're in technology, there's nothing better than utilizing the tools that already exist out there to put yourself out there. So don't be afraid of the online job postings just, or, you know, resume posting places, but just be aware that like anything else, of course, you're going to have to learn how to wade through the garbage. You know, you're going to have to learn how to communicate with people that they, they may not necessarily have your best interest in mind. They may not communicate very well with you, whether it's simply a language barrier or a lack of understanding of what it is that you do. Um, so there's a certain level, especially with the junior to mid-level, probably more so on the entry level, you know, junior level space that you're probably going to be working frequently with people who have about as much experience in what you're looking to do as what they do. You know, you're probably going to be talking with contra or recruiters who maybe have six months or a year, maybe two years, if you're lucky in the business of being a recruiter comparable to the six months, maybe to two years of experience that you might have in what you're looking to do as a side hustle. So whereas you're not an expert in that particular skill, they're probably not yet an expert in their field as well. So I think that's also important to keep in mind. And hopefully that helps you sort of meter your expectations, which is why it's great to have numerous different vehicles, numerous different channels of opportunities at your disposal so that you kind of know which ones are your better producers, which ones aren't, and you can sort of meter your efforts and your contributions to those relationships accordingly. Okay. Yeah. That makes, makes perfect sense actually. Huh. Interesting. So, um, you know, I wanted to just, uh, express my thought, um, <laughs> when, while you said that, and it was this, this is interesting. And it was nothing more than me thinking, well, if, if I want a side hustle, maybe that resume that I have is top heavy. Like for instance, uh, taking out my, um, address and just putting my email, my phone number, that way they yep. don't assume I'm in a location. And then maybe I just need to, um, t you know, senior, whatever, just make it look like I'm, you know, even though I have those other skills, but make it look like I'm only looking for a help desk. Maybe they, because maybe they won't, they'll see, Oh, well, this person for, for instance, me, I'm a, you know, senior, whatever, right. Systems administrator. 
maybe they'll think, oh, he's not qual or he won't want this job, but they don't know that I really want that help desk. So maybe that's the strategy to, to use is just to put in a help desk job. I'm, I'm looking for this and then get rid of all that other, uh, um, you know, um, top heavy stuff. Then when I'm in the interview, then I can just talk about the other stuff and then explain, oh, here's why I want this this uh, job. Maybe that's maybe that's the, the entry to the gatekeeper. Your thoughts? Wow. So, <clears throat> so that's a great, that's, so there's a lot to unpack there. Um, <laughs> uh, so I love, I love what you just said. And um, although maybe not necessarily for the reasons you might think. So um, I, I absolutely understand where you're coming from on your thought, because um, let me ask you this. Have you ever heard the feedback from a hiring manager or a recruiter or somebody else um, that old tried and true, uh, overqualified. I have. Yeah, I've heard. Okay. That. And you've probably never once in your life been frustrated when you've heard that, right? Never. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that speaks to your, to your point of what you're saying of, okay, maybe if I'm a, if I'm a seasoned professional in my space and I submit my seasoned professional resume to this position that clearly doesn't need a seasoned professional, am I immediately am I immediately putting myself behind the eight ball of getting consideration for that fact? Is that more or less what you're asking? More or less. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and, and I, I, so I talked about this in a previous podcast, but so I'm a, I'm a huge fan of transparency, huge fan of transparency. And so to the latter part of your statement before, um, I got engaged here was, um, do I want to tailor my resume? Do I want to remove some things on there that might uh, scare them off, discredit me as, uh, or, or, you know, perhaps not discredit, but uh, over overstate um, my experience for the position or job that I'd like to pick up on the side and kind of uh, reduce my chances of maybe getting a phone call or an interview, et cetera. And what I would encourage people to do is <clears throat> I'm a big fan and, and, really good technology companies or companies who need good technology folks. I'm a big fan of continuous education, right? And I think some of the best people in the technology field are the ones that are constantly picking up new skills related to, or at least uh, tangentially like related to the field of which you are an expert. And so since I'm a big fan of continued education for my own self, most people in this space are going to appreciate someone also who's saying, hey, listen, I have a particular set of skills, um, but I'm looking to expand that because I think that if I have a better understanding of all the moving parts within an organization's IT infrastructure, that that'll ultimately one day perhaps even make me better at what it is that I'm an expert in, as well as just better enhance my understanding of all the moving parts as a whole and make me a better asset, not just in the side hustle, but also in my core, you know, in, in what I do for a living. And so I would actually encourage folks to, to not um, remove things from a resume, especially like say someone, Gary, in your particular position, if you removed everything that overqualified you, they'd want to know what's, have you been working since 1979, right? Like, you know, and I'm making up a year, but you get what I'm saying is yes. you'd have to, you'd have to delete an awful lot of things that give you any credibility in any space whatsoever just to look to not look overqualified. And, and I think you're not alone there. And so I would just be upfront. I would, maybe I would change the summary or the mission statement on my resume, you know, seasoned it, you know, systems, analyst, systems, architect, systems, engineer with over 25 years of experience currently seeking part time or limited hour opportunities in the, in the areas of help desk in troubleshooting, you know, et cetera, what, whatever, in code development, in uh, programming, whatever that might be, I would just be honest because I, I think if you are, then when you do actually get those calls and you do actually get those opportunities, I think that you and the employer starting on the same level ground of understanding, I, I think that that's going to make ultimately the work that you do get better for them, better for you and a more rewarding experience. Plus I can't tell you how many times I put people to work over those that nine years where they came in to do one specific task or one specific to, to focus on one specific thing.
but because they had six months or a year of so of experience in something else that that particular customer happened to also leverage that experience in a different direction, um, even just for two hours over the life of a project. And so that person got to, you know, needle on something else for a little bit and it works in the opposite direction. So if you happen to come into something that is junior level, because that's what you wanted, um, but the manager, uh, he or she already knows from the onset that you're an expert in X, Y, Z, it's not uncommon for that person to then find a, you know, Mr. Or Mrs. Consultant. Uh, I know you're here doing this, but I also know from our conversation that you're an expert in this space and we're having just a hell of a problem with this and thought maybe you'd have a couple of minutes where you could take a look at this and see if you could lend us a hand. So you're in there doing what you wanted to do, which is your side hustle, but then you also get to lend some expertise perhaps in the area where you are already an expert and I think perhaps just enriching that opportunity as a whole and making it more rewarding for not just the client, but for yourself. So I, I would just, I would just shoot from the hip. I, I would just say, Hey, I, I got 25 years here. I, I'm not a junior level person in what I am an expert in, but I'm absolutely just getting started in coding. I've always been curious about coding. I've always wanted to learn more about it. I've spent the last X, Y, Z number of months or years immersing myself in it. I've been doing some coding and programming at home and I think I'm ready to start contributing to an organization in that space. And since I have 20 hours a week where I'm not needed doing anywhere else, I think I could really bring some value because I'm very eager and excited about this technology and I'd love to be a contributor. I think that's going to be more impactful to somebody who's hiring than to try and hide the fact that you're actually a senior level person in the space because I'm pretty sure two minutes after talking to you, Gary, it's going to be impossible to hide that you're not an expert in that space to some extent. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Would you agree? Would you agree? Oh yeah. 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 I, I yeah. agree with you. I, uh, my, my thinking was um, to get past the gatekeeper, you know, sometimes the recruiters are, I don't yeah. know what it is. It's the, uh, I, the, the names that shall not be named at recruiting companies <laughs> <laughs> out yeah. there. Let me talk to yeah. our accounts manager, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I got to meet with you to like make sure. And like, they were like, they were like a um, bartender before in college sure. or something. And like, why are you qualified to be an IT recruiter again? Oh, because I have a degree in whatever. Like, how is that? <laughs> Communications. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. HR. They have nothing, no idea about IT. And they're talking to the IT operations manager, he or she, and they're not conveying what I I'm talking about. And it's like, yeah, but uh, the funny thing, the funny thing is that's true. Even when you're applying for senior level positions in which you are immediately qualified for, right. Yeah. You know, I, just, just like the previous conversation. I mean, you're going to know real quick, the caliber of person you're dealing with right away. And so, you know, kind of like a comment I made earlier about metering expectations, you know, if you're, <laughs> Since as an expert in this space yourself, you're going to acknowledge and, and probably identify very quickly the caliber of person of individual that you're dealing with, um, whether it's for a senior level job or a, an entry level job, regardless. And so that might just be a, another, you know, as I discussed before, that really might just be a great example of a, of a call that in a relationship that you don't invest a whole lot of time into because they're probably not going to be a good resource. Um, I would also say leverage relationships with existing people that you already have, whether it's clients you've supported in the past, whether it's um, peers that you have in the industry who maybe already work in the space at which you're looking to break into, because especially for the companies they're already working at, that that's oftentimes an excellent opportunity to break into that space uh, on a side hustle level is if you already know someone who works in that space, uh, because generally at the junior to mid, like that junior level, most companies kind of have a revolving door at that, at that level. They don't have excellent retention when they're talking about bringing people in who are super green. Whereas somebody like yourself who has discipline, who understands the business, who understands that technology space is much more capable and qualified of dealing with the things that a, a person who's brand new into that space is going to encounter. And you're actually better equipped to deal with that position especially like mentally and emotionally being not new to the industry 
than say somebody who's fresh out of college and this is perhaps their first job who's and their first foray into the real world, uh, which can be obviously kind of jarring and shocking for some people sometimes. Um, so you already know how to navigate that arena. So you, you already have a leg up on somebody coming out of college. And if I was a hiring manager, I'd probably be more inclined, especially for a temporary position. I'd be more inclined to hire somebody like you than somebody out like an intern level that's just breaking in. I wonder if you could just talk to all those people I talk to sometimes from my outside. <laughs> just, just be my, be like my catalyst or whatever. Just talk on my behalf. Like this guy, you know, knows X, Y, Z. He doesn't know everything, but he knows this and that and the other. Like, um, what do you call it? Like a handler or like a yeah, yeah, like yeah. Uh, I'll be like a broker. Broker. There you go. Like a broker, uh, <laughs> yeah. IT recruit or an IT broker, basically. Yeah. Hey, you know, might have just created a new market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right yeah, yeah 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 and and i think that comes back to knowing knowing yourself and and being confident in, in how you want to market yourself as a as a person uh at, at really at any stage or to anyone um and so just as speaking about what you don't know as confidently as you speak about what you do you know, and, and, you know, you'll, you know, as well as I do, uh, and, and I'm sure the majority of the folks listening would agree that um, not knowing an answer, but knowing how to find an answer is oftentimes just as valuable as already knowing how to do something. So being able to say, you know, Mr. Ms. Manager to, to be, com to be completely transparent with you, I, I don't know the answer to what you're asking me, but I can confidently say that I know how to find the answer and I know how to do it in a way that's quick. That gets me back on task, right? That, that level of uh, problem solving, that's not common in interviews. And, and believe me for as many as you've been on, I've conducted more, right? Yeah. So that's not a common trait of people saying, I don't know, but I know how to find it. And I've put a lot of people to work into positions that they might not have been totally qualified for simply because they were able to convey that they know how to get the answer and how to collaborate and work with people to solve that problem that they don't know how to solve themselves just yet. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, you know, that would really be the, the crux there is just being able to say, Hey, I don't know, but I know how I know how to, I know how to find out how to know. <laughs> <laughs> so so i'll tell you I, this is not off topic but this is kind of on topic but there was a i don't know it was a um interview i don't know f six seven months ago something like that and it was with one of these three letter um uh um uh Let's see. It was a bit. It was like a Lockheed Martin type of company. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yep, anyway, yep. so um, government contractor. Yeah, government contract. Yeah. So I go in the interview, and um, they're all in suit and ties, and I had a shirt on, a nice shirt. You know, um, did I wear a tie? I think I might wear. No, I didn't have a tie, but everybody else is wearing a tie, kind of like buttoned up or whatever. Um, almost like the IBM type, right? That's kind of sure. Thing. So. The, they asked me some questions and, and, you know, it wasn't really a lot of, they asked me some technical stuff, but I, the questions that I asked them was more about the people. I cared more about um, the people in the, in the working there. Cause you know, I mean, I guess it's just because like I've worked so many companies, I want to just work at a place where I don't have to with on a Friday afternoon, I don't have to, think about that other coworker doing their job. I know they got it. If I don't have to get called on a Friday, basically do their job because they don't know how basically. Right. So that's, that didn't say that, but that's kind of how I was getting at. Like what I was asking about in the interview was like, um, tell me about, I was trying to convey to them when I work at a place that um, I try to find out the people that are kind of shy and trying to, and bring them up basically, you know, like there's something their leadership is not uh, doing for them that, that that person is not contributing to the rest of the team, which translates later on into it's Friday and they've never probably experienced a lot of like, for instance, um, I can remember one time, this is me going off topic a little bit, but when the system was down, it was like, I did an upgrade or whatever on a net app and it was Friday. Um, 
And okay, I just need to figure it out, right? Okay, you know, I called Net up, right, of course, and I got it up uh, like eight hours later. But I know there's other folks that I've worked with, and I know there's people out there who are like kind of like, it's kind of like a little overwhelmed or who can be overwhelmed, right? And that's, right. that's the whole goal, I guess, for me when I work at a place is to bring them up. Not that I'm any higher or whatever, but more like, let's, let's see what skill you have and I can learn from you and you can learn from me. That way, when it's on a Friday and the system needs to be back online because Monday you don't want to come in and get a big, big problem. You know how to troubleshoot. You know how to who to call and expedite and say, "Well, the server is down, um, and it's been five minutes. I can't figure it out. I'm calling the vendor." That's how I, you know, and and I've I've been in this situation before where, um, you know, I rack my brain trying to figure it out. That never works. That's never a solution. The better solution is to just call the vendor after like five or ten minutes can't work. Let me call the vendor. And um, I I got a lot of flack actually the last couple couple jobs ago where I'd call the vendor all the time <laughs> and it was it was like literally on a week I would call the vendor like two different vendors I would call them like an hour every week at, at the minimum because there's always these little things that I don't know about and I would get some kind of like flack a little bit from my coworkers. like I told them I said you know like I don't these this is a billion dollar company I don't know everything who can know everything I don't, that's not my, no, I'm here to facilitate and to make it work and, um, and to learn as well. But why rack my brain? Let's, let me just, let's hand it off to somebody who knows more about it. And that way I can learn and, and through them teaching me basically. But, um, you know, what I was going after, right. My initial point was, um, because of the, you know, the, it'd be nice to know (laughs) if there's a magic pill basically where you know what people are thinking on the other side. And, um, and and I say this to say this, the money factor, a lot of companies, maybe they think this, but they always think it's like money. But the more I figure out it, the more I understand it, it's less about money. Money is important, but it's more about like, do I, you know, I, I want to follow a good leader. I don't want to follow um, money. I want to follow a good leader. I, I can, I can, you know, take less money here uh, for something else, but I don't want to be, have a, a, a bad leader who's like, you know, micromanaging like that never works out. I, I've experienced that already. I wonder if there's something you can talk about that. I know you probably haven't um, a recruiter, but maybe there's some things that you could probably go over like the, um, um, you know, um, how to, in your view or a company's view, basically, or what they are a lot. If there's bad feedback from a company about, um, a, a past, uh, people working there or past, um, uh, candidates, are you allowed to tell me, Oh, that's probably bad you know, there's a, they didn't hire that because there's a bad leadership. Do you, can you talk about stuff like that? Or is that like, yeah, you have like NDA or something? No, no, no. Oh, well, no, no, that's fine. So that's, so that's a great, God, there's a lot there. That's a great question. So yeah, I could definitely talk about that. And that's a, that's a hot button for me because, um, so fun fact, Three out of the last four years um, of my career as a recruiter, I actually served as the manager of my division. So not only was I still uh, maintaining my own book of business and maintaining my own relationships and clientele and continuing to put people to work, but I was also mentoring and training and leading uh, a group of people that I had hired underneath me to do the same thing at the same time. So... Um, I could speak to, you know, obviously from just from a producer standpoint, as well as from a management standpoint. And, you know, in my management career, I received a lot of, you know, really excellent feedback uh, that that I think helped make me a better leader um, over time. And I want to emphasize something that I I just said, you noticed, you may have noticed that uh, I never referred to myself, other than title, I never referred to myself as managing people or managing or as a manager. And there's a very important distinction to be made there. And it goes back to your point, which is you said, I want to follow a good leader, right? 
right? I want to follow a good leader. I don't want to follow the money. I want to work, I want to, I want to work for a good leader. And I, I think first and foremost, it's important to, to define the distinction there because people might think, well, that just, that's just semantics, a leader, manager, whatever, right? They're, they're the person you report to. Sure. If you want to get super vanilla about it, yeah, they're the person you report to, but a manager is great at telling people what to do. A leader is great at showing people and setting the example of what to do. A leader is somebody that people want to follow. A manager is someone that people work for. And I think that's an important distinction to be made. So with that understanding in mind, as a recruiter, um, and this goes back to a previous podcast also, um, I always took it upon myself when talking with contractors to understand what it was they did and did not like about previous positions they had worked. And micromanagement was oftentimes a common trend. And I think you're going to find that anywhere where there's a management structure, that there's going to be someone complaining that they feel micromanaged, whether micromanagement is, ex is existing at that particular time or not is purely subjective. But, um, and the reasons is that it was important for me to, an to know those answers was because, um, again, speaking back to a previous podcast, I took it very seriously to try and match somebody to a position that matched as many factors as they could of the things that they wanted, as well as trying to avoid things that I knew from past jobs were not good fits or were things that they were actively looking to not find a scenario that they were actively looking to not find themselves in again. So let's say, for example, a consultant said to me, um, you know, the last, the last, what I didn't like about my last project was um, it was a very stressful environment. It was stressful from the perspective of the fact that it kind of seemed sometimes like the left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. Um, management, there wasn't really great communication from management down the line. Um, or, you know, there was too many managers, too many hands in the cookie jar, if you will. And, you know, I, I had to go to this person for this and this person for that. And just the, the delegation was bad. And, you know, honestly, that just, I didn't work well in that environment. And that's one of the reasons why when the contract didn't renew, I was really happy not to stick around. Awesome. Great. So if I know in advance as a recruiter, I always took it upon myself also because the role that I had at the organization where I was the last nine years, I, I held a, a bit of a hybrid role in the sense that not only did I work with the talent such as yourself, but I also worked and spoke and uh, interacted directly with the hiring manager who would ultimately become that person's managing or, or that their manager, the director, et cetera. So I had a relationship with both the client and with the consultants. And so I wanted to learn everything I could about that person, that team's in, or that environment of that team. How many people, what was the dynamic? Was it team focused? Was it more individualistic? What's the management structure? Uh, what's the reporting structure as far as expectations? Um, you know, because if I, the better I could understand the environment, then the better I could inform you, you know, I could be on the phone with you and you could say similar feedback to what I mentioned earlier. And, and I could say, Hey Gary, you know, I, I don't know if this particular position is really going to be a great fit for you. Cause I, I remembered that you had mentioned to me, you know, that the communication seemed a little bit spotty and that the environment was a bit chaotic. And I said, you know, th this, this environment is very similar to that. Um, there's, there's, it's, it's, it's heavily regulated. So it's very chaotic. It's very fast moving. Um, you know, re requirements and, uh, commands and, uh, uh, you know, tasks that you're being assigned can change, you know, within the hour or while you're in the middle of something. And then I can give you that information and say, and you can make a decision. Well, okay, yeah, that's, you know, but you know what, I'm, I'm still interested. Let's, let's, you know, talk more about it. Or you might say, Hey, you know what? Yeah. Thanks for letting me know that, that, that probably would have been a bad fit. And even if the location was great and the money was great. I mean, if you told me that that's an environment you don't thrive in, then I, I was working to try to not put you in that environment again. Um, and of course, just like a lot of lessons learned, that was something that I learned the hard way by doing it the wrong way. And, you know, having contractors quit or get fired uh, because I didn't take the time to ask those questions. I didn't know those things. 
either about the client or about the consultant. And as a result, I ended up walking them out of the frying pan into the fire. And so like most policies, they're learned from past mistakes. And uh, that was no different for me. So um, I, I always want to disclose that kind of information. Like, and I'll tell you what, I had absolutely no qualms whatsoever of saying, you know what, the, I, I don't know that this manager is the right person for you to work for. Um, uh, you know, cause usually I wouldn't disclose the customer. So really I wasn't, uh, I wasn't uh, harming reputation of anybody, but you know, I, I would have had no problem to you, you know, or to any consultant, you know, that I was working with to say, you know what, this manager was recently promoted into this position um, from a completely different role within the company in a completely different skill set, And based on what I know about you, Gary, I, I don't think this would be a good personality fit for you. And I would elaborate if you had asked me to, but no, I, I, there was no, you know, non-disclosure. There was, there was nothing that prevented me. And I'll tell you what, if there was, I didn't care because at the end of the day, like I said before, I wanted you to start the job. I wanted you to finish the job and I wanted you to want to continue working with me because I was putting you on successful projects that helped you further your career or helped you provide for your family. And so the more information I could give you, the more informed I could make you, the better than the better my odds were of being able to get that desired goal. And even if that meant not taking the job or not even doing the interview, then to me, that's a successful outcome. Oh, Gary. Yeah, that was great. So um, I think it's, uh, let's wrap it up. Uh, what, how can people reach you? How can they get in contact with you if they have any questions about uh, your, your knowledge and the services you have? Absolutely. So the best way to reach me right now is actually through email. And so that's going to be Gary, uh, G-A-R-Y dot Rada, R-A-D Delta A. So Gary dot Rada at N as in Nancy, M as in Michael, nm.com. Awesome. So really appreciate Gary. Uh, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast.